welcome. Welcome. We're glad to have you. And uh, we've talked about input obsession. We've talked about collaboration and experimentation. And then today, today's session is all about what we're calling updating your creative operating system. And I wanted to begin today with a little bit of a story. Um, I was at the airport recently and I was frantically hustling to catch the tram to get back home. I'd been gone from my family for a long time and I was eager to make the bedtime routine. Um, little did I know that I made a really bad decision in not catching an Uber and I instead had parked my car at the airport and had to take the tram to long-term parking. Um, it involved a sprint across multiple terminals and uh, sprinting with bags up of several flights of stairs. Not that I don't enjoy something like that, but as I crested the fourth floor of stairs that I was uh, running up, I heard the ominous noise. The doors are closing. The doors are, you probably heard that, you know that feeling, right? And I frantically, with everything I had, you know, last 10 meters, so to speak, as the doors are shutting, I lunge through, catch the doors, and heroically, like He-Man, open them up and get in. And look, there's probably 30 people aghast, somewhat impressed, I think, at the superhuman display of strength, but also shocked that I risked life and limb. I, I thought this is evidence that I'm a great father. This is the evidence that I'm going to make it. And people were high-fiving me as sweat's dripping down my face. And I go and sit down and I just take a breath. I've been traveling. I'm finally on the tram. I'm going to get to my car. And I absentmindedly start checking my phone, watching, you know, vaguely the map above head. And it took about 15 minutes before the thought dawned on me long-term parking isn't getting any closer. In fact, it's just getting farther away. And it was at that point that I realized I didn't get on the blue line train. I got on the pink line train. And the pink line train is not ever going to get me to long-term parking. It literally never makes it to that destination. And I sat there just shocked at my silliness. And I tell this story uh, simply to say, we do the same thing all the time when we're trying to solve problems. We are faced with enormous pressure. We're sprinting upstairs and across terminals at work, so to speak. We need to have the answers yesterday. And there may be a closing door of the first great idea that we see, and we scramble to it with all of our might to get to it. Maybe it's not the first, maybe it's the second. Some recent research that I've been looking at indicates that many brainstorms inside organizations never generate more than two ideas. It's baffling. And part of what is driving that tendency to fixate on the first idea that comes up, the first set of doors that are closing is this psychological phenomenon known as cognitive closure. It turns out human beings are distressed by uncertainty. And what psychologists have discovered is that they will fixate, we will fixate on whatever answer comes to mind as quickly as possible so as to at least superficially dispel whatever feelings of discomfort are aroused by uncertainty. Even what's, what's fascinating to me is that even when teams and individuals are prompted to generate broadly and to flare wildly, yet they routinely underestimate their performance. One study conducted in the late 1980s at the University of Oklahoma gave graduate students the prompt to solve a creative challenge around campus parking. And their goal was to generate as many solutions as possible and to come up with as many of the good ideas as there are possible in the space. They were given unlimited time and students after they had been working diligently on this problem handed in their assignments, so to speak. The proctor of the research asked how many of the possible solutions do you think you came up with? And the average student something, said something like 75%. There was a board of experts who had also been working on the problem and they compared the list that students generated to the list of their ideas. And what was amazing is students who felt they had probably covered 75% of the total volume of good ideas had actually 
on average, only uncovered one out of every three good ideas that the team of experts had come up with. It's not to say that the experts came up with all of them, but it's simply to say we dramatically overestimate the extent to which we're generating sufficient volume of good ideas. Why is that so important? It's so important because what we are very confident saying is that the single greatest determinant of the quality of your ideas is actually the quantity of your ideas. And yet, due to this tendency towards cognitive closure and the distress that we experience when we're facing uncertainty, we tend to fixate on a solution and like, likely a suboptimal solution. There's another piece of research called uh, the creative cliff illusion that demonstrates how participants tend to think that their best ideas come out early and they have no more good ideas. But the truth is, if they continue or persist in divergence, their ideas continue to be as creative, if not more creative. And so what we would say is instead of looking for better ideas, part of what it means to update the creative operating system is actually to focus on generating more ideas. But that is a tr transformative and foundational paradigm shift. The vast majority of us have a tendency to focus on better rather than more. How does this manifest itself? It manifests itself not only when we are trying to come up with new products or services or innovations, you know, capital I, so to speak, but it happens all the time when we're trying to craft a subject line to an email, when we're trying to get our kids to eat their vegetables, when we're trying to figure out a way to deliver some tough news in a performance evaluation. And for this reason, what we would say is every problem is fundamentally an idea problem, meaning when you think about a problem as an idea problem, you tend to think in terms of quantity. I need to diverge. I need to generate. And what we'd suggest and submit to you all is that every problem actually would benefit from a focus on volume first rather than quality first. I'll give you an example. We've got four children in my home and we regularly receive grocery deliveries. Uh, our front door faces westward, so the afternoon sun is always beating down on perishable goods, frozen goods, et cetera. And so anytime there's a delivery, it's kind of a everybody drop everything situation and help out. And I personally dread that. <laughs> it's the, uh, the 50 meters between the front door and the kitchen, whatever it is, carrying groceries in the middle of the day is not fun. But you know what? I think about it like a task. It's just a matter of gritting my teeth and bearing it. You know how my nine-year-old thought of it the other day? She put her sister on a ride and she threw a bunch of groceries on a blanket and then she just shimmied the blanket down the hallway. It's a great example that what to me is a simple task that's got to be executed, if given just a little bit of creative divergent thinking, it can actually be something fun. It can be something that we enjoy. And, and we have all experienced these moments in our lives where we had a eureka, we had an epiphany, and it turned something that was laborious and mundane into something that was magical and fun and interesting. And what we'd say is, it's that paradigm shift that we're hoping to invoke. When we talk about updating your creative operating system, it's shifting from a focus on good ideas to lots of ideas. And the reality is, to get a good idea, as Linus Pauling said, you need a lot of ideas. That's the underlying reality. But what very few people appreciate is the volume of ideas you really need to get to good. One of our colleagues at Stanford, Professor Bob Sutton, who's in the School of Engineering, did a longitudinal study of some innovation firms. And this is what he discovered. If, you, if an organization wanted to successfully deliver new innovations to the market, two or three innovations come out of a process that starts with around 4,000 ideas. And what we've observed is if an organization wants to deliver two or three new good ideas, they tend to think in terms of maybe we need four or five, maybe we need six or seven. And there's this, uh, this ubiquitous underestimation of the kind of volume that's needed to actually generate a breakthrough. And while this, the, the proportions may be different when it comes to day-to-day -day 
challenges and problems like crafting a subject line to an email or delivering a difficult piece of news. Yet the same is true. A multitude of ideas is necessary to get to one good one. And very, very few people think about that. So what do we do as we're grappling with this tendency towards cognitive closure? How do we start short circuiting our tendency to look for the right answer rather than generating many possibly uh, successful answers? Simply stated, we need to practice. You can think about the moment that you need a good idea, like the moment you got to run a 400 meter dash. I don't know about you all, but if you asked me to run a 400 meter dash right now, I would hurt myself. <laughs> I'd pull a muscle or, you know, at the very least, I'd need, a, I'd need my inhaler, right? Very few of us are ready to instantaneously sprint into action. What do we need? We need a regular practice of strength training and stretching and time trials, et cetera. And it's no different when it comes to divergence. Our brain is a muscle just like any other muscle in our body. And so what we advocate is the practice that we call a daily idea quota, which is a very, very simple practice where once per day, you assess your life and you say, where are we looking for the right answer right now? Maybe we didn't even realize we we're looking for one answer, but effectively and operatively, we're looking for the right answer. Where is that place? And then flip the script or flip your orientation and say, instead, Let's try generating many answers. This is not first and foremost about discovering the right answer. This is first and, first and foremost about building the muscle of divergent thinking, of building the muscle to resist that longing for cognitive closure that may be efficient, but is rarely effective when we're looking for new ideas. So we actually wanna practice this right now. If you get out your phone, you can join the Stanford Creative Masters WhatsApp group. If you scan it, you'll join the group. And what I want you to do is I want you to try flipping a problem in your life right now. Just put your name. We, maybe somebody could drop this in the chat. Write your name and where you're coming from. So Jeremy, Mountain View, problem where you're looking for the right answer, whatever it is. It could be in your personal life, it could be in your work life, it could be a big problem, little problem, doesn't matter. And then I wanna prompt you or challenge you to right now, generate 10 bad ideas, a multitude of bad ideas, rather than fixating on one good idea, just for a moment. All right, folks, so I saw several people actually got to 10 which is awesome. Some of you are going, how did you get to 10? And you, you know the answer? They, they obeyed the instructions of a multitude of bad ideas is necessary for a good idea. We are so deeply wired to only write down good ideas. The reason you couldn't get to 10 if you couldn't do it in a short period of time is because you've put this parenthetical good in front of the word, ideas. I, and, and the pain of even typing out an idea that looks absurd or nonsensical in a WhatsApp group with a bunch of strangers, for whatever reason, by the way, we didn't mean to load the deck against you. That was not our intent. But the point is simply, it's fascinating. It cost, the, what is the cost of a bad idea? It's basically zero. It literally costs us nothing to write down something that's nonsensical. And yet we're so, we've got so deeply ingrained this tendency towards a fear of judgment, a fear of looking foolish or whatever it might be that we just can't break out. That's why this practice is so important. If you found that this was difficult, it's especially relevant and especially important for you. And because we have, as we've been advocating this daily idea quota with folks, one of the things we've discovered is how someone incorporates it into their life is very important. And so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to shift to an application module where we focus on how do we practically implement the daily idea quota into our lives in the way that builds the resilience and builds the muscles necessary so that when the divergent moment comes, our muscle memory and our instinct isn't towards cognitive closure, but it's, it starts with uh, appreciation for 
the imperative of volume. So I'm going to turn it over to Catherine and she's going to help us by doing a bit of a habit design module that will help us bring this single practice of the daily idea quota into the context of your life when it will work for you. All right, everyone. Welcome. It's awesome to be here with you. Um, and excited to see some uh, new faces, but also familiar faces in the crowd. So as Jeremy was saying, um, we had you try out idea generation there, kind of a, a, a cold call, I suppose. Um, but we think idea generation is actually an ideas problem as well, in a way. Uh, we've spent some time on how can we help people generate a lot of ideas. And the basic principle behind that, we believe, is that you, you need to establish a creative practice of some sort, right? There's many different practices you could uh, develop, and you probably have many practices in other areas of life. But um, what we'd like to say is that a practice is um, just like anything else you can design. We believe at the D School that you can design it. And the fundamental, the smallest block um, or building block of a practice, we believe, is creating a habit. And so today, we are actually going to work on uh, designing a habit to, in this case, generate many ideas. But we'll record this and share it with you, and you could design this to, or you could use this module to create um, many different habits. It wouldn't have to be idea generation. And a lot of my um, understanding of this and work around designing this module has come from a book called Atomic Habits. So if you're interested in reading or learning more, I would recommend this book, really practical advice, great story on the author um, in there as well. All right, um, so what I'd like to do is uh, do this. We are going to freeze a couple of things to make this habit module easy. And one of the things we're going to freeze is exactly what you just did. We're going to suppose that your habit for the next 60, uh, 40 minutes with us now will be actually um, des uh, designing a habit that helps you get to 10 ideas, okay? So everyone, you know the what of your habit right now. It's going to be to generate 10 ideas, but the how is actually something that we'll design. Before we get into the how, I want to give you a little sense for how powerful this habit or really tiny change in your life could be. So what I'd like to do is draw a graph here. You might be able to help me with this. Okay, so here's what we have. Um, I have um, an XY graph. Okay, so here's the Y axis. Here's the X axis Ooh, on the bottom of the screen. Okay, so what we have down here is your um, is time. Okay, so here's day zero. Let's say that's where we are. And down here will be, let's say, a year from now. Okay, so um, you, you know, in a week or so, we'd be over here. So what, um, in fact, you feel free to put this in chat, or I also have my WhatsApp thread here, so we can use that thread if you'd like as well. We'll kind of be mono or duo threaded, if that <laughs> makes sense, multiple threads here. Um, the WhatsApp thread is really nice because we can respond to that later, keep a record of it, and you'll have that opportunity too. So um, what do you think, um, if this over here is your progress, the y-axis is your progress, maybe I'll write a backwards P for you, and down here is time, um, what do you think your progress should look like over time? What would be this relationship? Feel free to put in chat, what would be the relationship over time? As a starting assumption, if you didn't get any better or any worse over time, your progress would look something like this, right? Let's say you have a pretty low progress in creating ideas over time right now, if you're a beginner. So it would look like that over time. Yeah, Hisham, progress would build upwards over time or be linear. Yeah, okay, great. So a lot of people would expect if you're a rational human being, and many times we think we would act that way, progress over time would look like this. That seems pretty reasonable, I agree. Um, but what I want to propose is this, and there's a little math behind it, which I think makes it fun, but let's say that you get 1% worse each day. Okay, so let's assume for a second that progress isn't linear like this and that you're not going to just stay the same. But there's another relationship at play. So let's say that you get 1% worse each day. Okay, And what that looks like in a math equation is 0.99 raised to the 365th. You would actually um, be 0.03 of your original self, right, in terms of progress. So your line would look something like this. You go down pretty fast, and then it would just bottom out, at almost zero. Right? So that's if you just got 1% worse each day. 
let's say you didn't have a habit and you were getting busier and busier, you'd eventually look like that in idea generation over time. But let's assume something else, which might not sound exciting, but is pretty um, simple. And I think in that way is really exciting is what if you got 1% better each day? It's not very much, right? Just 1% better than the day before. And so that math equation would look like this. And you'd be almost 40 times your original self in terms of progress after 365 days. So I think somebody may have said it in chat already. Um, this looks a lot more like you'd start at your standard line. Let's say you're here and your line would look kind of boring for a little bit of time. And then boom, it starts to look like this. Okay, so it's exponential in many ways, right? And um, the, the, maybe the challenge with this, I would say, if you're like me and you like to assume many things are rational or even linear in life, I think that, you know, in three months, four months, five months, six months, I expect myself to be here. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit better each day. Really what would happen if I'm only getting 1% better each day is I'm here. And that doesn't feel very good because it actually doesn't look like I've improved very much, right? And so what we have in habit creation, which is um, which is important to keep in mind for your own expectations is that we have this area right here. If you had to name this area on the graph, what would you call this area? This is where you expect your progress to be and yet your progress is actually down here. It's a challenge to stick with it over 60 days because there's a threshold to establish the new habit. Yeah, the trough of disappointment, <laughs> the valley of despair. It just stinks, honestly. The delta of disillusionment. <laughs> okay, you guys should teach. I love this. Failing to meet expectations. Um, I want my progress to look like AAPL this quarter, <laughs> the expectation lag. Okay, awesome. You guys have so many great understandings of this. I don't know what the sigmoid curve is, but maybe we could have a lecture by Tarana after this experience. But yes, in general, this doesn't feel great. And yet you're on the way, you're actually on the cusp of something truly amazing, right? So if I um, take a little bit of time to erase this so you can see through here again. Oh, I really wanted to try this for fun. I find it's a little bit easier if I just like clean my brain a little bit. Do you ever feel that? No? <laughs> you just clean this mess up a little bit. Okay, so instead, if you could think about this as you're pushing through that trough, the valley of disillusionment, the things that you guys were describing it as is perfect, is remind yourself progress is not linear an existential crisis. <laughs> oh, you guys are better and better. Our greatest returns are actually delayed, okay? And the habits are basically compound interest, okay? So this is a framework to think about habit design and what you can expect over the next week, three months, four months, six months, seven months could be really exponential. Um, but this is what just being 1% better each day is. And I really think that's truly possible if we create a habit that you can stick with. So if we can take on the challenge of creating a habit that you can stick with and you can get 1% better each day, which I think both are possible, I think each of you could be to really exponential improvement in terms of your idea flow or your idea generation within six months. You could look like really different people. You could be 40X yourself. That's pretty exciting actually. Okay, so with that, what we want to do is we want to start working on this um, with our habit module here. So um, if you ever want to look up a story, I won't go into the details now, but there is a British cyclist coach who joined the team, I think about 20 years ago, if I remember right. Um, they hadn't, that team hadn't won um, a Tour de France in their whole history of the team. And this coach was brought on to bring them, bring their record up in that way. Um, he made many 1% changes, really cool story, tiny things, how they washed their hands, how they slept, how they stored their bikes. He just went across the board and made tiny 1% improvements. Um, I won't give it away, but he had pretty amazing impact. In fact, he just gave me goosebumps. In six months, you will not believe, or sorry, in six years, you will not believe how many uh, Tour de France's he had the team win. Really awesome. Um, there are other things that work like this. 
Um, obviously, some things in the financial arena work like this and investments. Uh, bamboo grows like this. It's very exponential. It's low and slow below the surface for a while before it explodes. Cancer is often thought to work this way. So whether it's um, a positive or a negative, it can be really, really progressive growth. Um, it's just not linear. So with that, what we want to do is this. Now I'd love for you to get out, at least for me, I like to work in a workshop module um, for this one in a very analog way. Actually, I have my idea notebook right here. So you might want to grab a piece of paper. Printer paper is fine. The back of something is also fine, but I like to work analog on this for now. And you're just going to open it up or lay it out on your um, sheet, out on your desk to have a blank piece of paper. And what I'd like you to do is draw a two by two. All right, we're going to work through a quadrant system. So I'll try to do it here for you. So you just draw one line down the center, one line across. There you go. Okay, so the first quadrant we're going to work on, and we'll actually work all the way around. Um, we have time. Today, my first one, um, the most interesting, I think, actually, is the Q. Okay, so in the top left for you, I think, if I'm doing this right, um, you'll write Q. That's a very part, important part of the habit. In the second quadrant, you will call that the craving part of the design. Super fun to design around. Um, the next one you would use is the reward. Oops, sorry, I think I have this backwards. Yes, after craving is not reward, but the response, and then reward. So these are the quadrants that we can design around and we'll start at the top and uh, we'll work our way around. So let's go back to just Q in the top left. I'll keep these here ready for me to move on. And uh, the Q is a really uh, fun one, actually. Does anybody want to guess what, um, what category of Q do we most often use in our regular life? What tells us to begin something, the next thing that we're supposed to do? What would you say if you had to guess? I'll look in chat. I'll look here in our WhatsApp thread. Time, okay, what time it is tells us. That's a really great one, you're right. That seems also very just reasonable, the clock. Um, whether it's urgency, okay, the stimulus, some, some sort of stimulus or a visual cue, a request from kids, <laughs> amen, I hear you. Survival, a certain problem, the end of something else. Garrett, the end of something else. Almost, I think 60% of our behavior um, I can look that up in research, but I think it's pretty close to 60, is actually cued by the thing that happens right before it. <laughs> it's incredibly maybe disappointing to hear that, but that is true. You often cue your next behavior by the thing you did just before it, okay? So that is an interesting way to think about cue in habit design. The other thing that is a typical category for what cues us to do something is a context. Space, a next tax, a next um, task, a physical item in your context can be that. Um, a child, of course, could be that, their request for you. Uh, but there are things in our context that are more, um, uh, that are more uh, salient to us. And there are also things that are more predictable, right? If you're going to use the sun rising as a contextual clue, that happens every day at almost exactly the same time, that's a really consistent piece of context that you could use as a cue. So what I want you to do right now is in your head, think for a second, like go through your day. What are things that regularly happen to you? You can put this in chat or you can put this in WhatsApp thread. This could be a potential cue, right? Waking up, I'll put that in. Um, yes, habit stacking is so true. I, I'm only able to keep track of part of the chat here, but this is awesome. You're right, it is close to habit stacking. So if I put wake up, that's one of the very first things I do. I'll put that in chat or in the WhatsApp thread. I often, if I'm honest, I check my email and then I often check my calendar for the day. Yeah, that's great, Ingo. Another one for me is my morning coffee. Okay, take a shower, yeah, brush your teeth. Okay, so start to list some of these. What we're going to do next is you're going to pick either a cue that's contextual or a cue that's a behavior of something you already do that will prompt you to begin this new behavior. If your goal is to establish a habit here, then what we can do is 
make sure that you're constantly and break or not constantly but regularly cued to do it okay so what i'd like you to think about now is in our queue we want to make it obvious okay so as you're looking at this is kind of amazing because you get to brainstorm with 317 people that are on here today you're getting to see many different things that you might consider a cue for your habit okay so let's see here i might take from stano he says that he works out so maybe you have an idea generation, I actually tried this, an idea generation cue that when you work out is also your time to generate ideas. Okay, maybe you text yourself, I do that regularly, and maybe you just keep a notebook with you when you're um, working out, that could be an option. Maybe it's when you, um, when you make coffee in the morning, you put your idea notebook there. That's actually two things combined. So you make coffee, that's a contextual cue for you, or that's a behavior, you always do it, or almost always do it every morning. And you could make a context cue, a physical artifact, um, to help even further enforce that by putting your idea notebook by the coffee maker each morning. So maybe as it brews or as you grind your beans or whatever it is your coffee routine is, or maybe sometimes it's just instant coffee, then you can make your idea during, you could uh, jot down your ideas during that and while you drink your first cup of coffee. Okay, that would be an example. So why don't we do this? Why don't you take a couple of moments right now? Um, team, you can help me structure time here if you'd like. But why don't we take two minutes with a little bit of music, put in the chat or in the WhatsApp thread. Again, if you're able to do WhatsApp thread, we recommend it just because that's something that will persist past our um, webinar here. Um, but um, start dropping in things that could be your cue. Okay, again, it could be a space thing where you're going to put your notebook or your pen. Or it could just be something that you do regularly. So for this, you can brainstorm it with these prompts. After I blank, I will dot, 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 okay? 10 ideas, we know that. So you can say, after I blank, I will blank. Okay, that can be your, oh, so many fun jokes in here. I wanna be reading the chat too. Okay, so you could put a, a brainstorm idea like this in chat or blank will be my cue. My idea notebook next to my coffee machine will be my cue. After I um, check my calendar, I will generate 10 ideas, okay? So here are some prompts to use. Use this one, this one here, or this one here, and drop your ideas in chat or in the WhatsApp thread. Then after a couple minutes, you're gonna get to scan all of these and pick the one, even if it's somebody else's idea, that you want to use as a cue for your habit design. Okay, so I think with that, let's turn on a little bit of music. I'll be in WhatsApp and maybe I'll be in chat too if I need to be, and we'll generate a few cue ideas together. Concludes our cue portion. So what you should do now is find one that you liked in chat, find one that you liked in the WhatsApp thread, circle one, kind of in your head, I suppose, and then write it down. Okay. And it should come in this format. Either after I blank, I will, and you know that's create 10 ideas, or this format, blank will be my cue to generate 10 ideas. Okay. So you have one thing written in your notebook in this quadrant, which is your Q quadrant. It's either this format or this format. Okay, so that concludes the Q section. Let's move on to um, craving. I love getting to design our cravings. <laughs> They're so powerful, right? Um, okay, so um, here's what we need to know about cravings. Uh, cravings are, um, are ideal if they're truly irresistible. That sounds a little silly, but a lot of times the really powerful um, uh, chemical reaction we get in, in our brain is actually not from completing the habit, which sounds kind of silly. Our brain actually gets a bigger hit when we're craving something that's associated with the habit. The anticipation is often a stronger emotional reaction than the actual doing of the thing. It's so bizarre, but I think that's really interesting about humans, and it's true in habit creation too. So what we'd like you to do is think about designing a craving as part of your habit, um, and the goal is to make it irresistible, all right? So there are so many fun ideas around this one that I've heard um, over the last few weeks or months as we've been running um, this with a few other students that we have, and um, you might call this um, a temptation bundling, all right? So if I bundle something that I'm tempted to do, 
with the things that I know I have to do, they come together and you're often more likely to complete the habit that you've set out to complete. So I'll share something about me is I enjoy browsing social media um, and specifically Instagram lives um, or Instagram videos. And so I only allow myself to do that during the day while I'm working out. So I put my workout instructor video here on my screen. I put my um, Instagram live video here. And while I work out, I get to listen to Instagram live. Um, that might sound silly to you. I crave that. I find that really fun and interesting. Or maybe you have a certain TV show or a certain movie or a certain podcast or audible book that you like. Once I heard of a student who uh, was very um, um, smart um, mechanical engineer. He decided that he loved watching Netflix too much, but maybe he could use this as a craving to design his habit to exercise more in his case. So he created a device that was connected to his bicycle and it would only play Netflix. His TV would only get power to play Netflix um, while the bike was being used. And if it wasn't being used, then it would turn off. Maybe you have the smarts to do that, or maybe you just have a way to hack something together like that. Uh, that to me is a really, really powerful example of how you temptation bundle and you do it in a way that you actually can't break it, right? You can't disassociate them unless you go to, um, to redesigning the device. So um, why don't we do this now in chat is what I'd like you to do is use this format, which is after I blank, which is your new habit, then I get to blank, or it could be while I blank, then I get to blank. I think I might have to, oh, here's one of my sticky notes. I'm gonna see a sticky notes over here. So after I blank, I get to, or it might be while I blank. I get to. The blank is 10 ideas. We've fixed that. You could use another habit if you wanted to rewatch this and do that. Um, awesome. I don't see any questions in chat right now or in WhatsApp, uh, but feel free to interrupt me, Jeremy and Joe, if, if there's something I'm missing. But now I would like you to go ahead and put in uh, WhatsApp. Um, yeah, I love it. We've already got some here. To put in WhatsApp, what is the thing you crave that you're going to get to do? after or while you generate your 10 ideas. You can watch YouTube, I love it. I get to use my computer and work, Kunal. You're so dedicated to work. I don't know that I crave my computer and work. Okay, if that works for you, awesome, that works for you. Watching K-dramas, I love it. I'm assuming that might be Korean dramas, is that true? Um, after I generate ideas, I can watch some YouTube video, that's awesome. Yes, the True Cry podcast, <laughs> so fun. <laughs> Oh, Catherine, I'm with you. Having my cup of coffee and looking at Twitter or social media, that's what I crave. And so you'll do that after you generate your 10 ideas. Yeah, do you know what? One thing I did the other day that actually helped me um, generate ideas and was enjoyable was listen to a TED Talk. So I turned on a TED Talk. It gave me some new inspiration and it was also really fun. And so um, I, I did that as one of my craving experiments. Yes, Kia, I am super driven by food and dessert specifically. So maybe you have your favorite chocolate and you only get to enjoy that as you're generating ideas. Um, you get to have a scoop of ice cream, <laughs> May. <laughs> so true, I love it. After all, we're not that different than kids at heart. I love it. Um, you can water your garden. Oh, Linda, that's awesome. I wish I was as craving that as you are. My plants don't respond well to my lack of attention. Um, audiobooks, I get to sit. Okay, awesome. Maybe you have like a certain self-care ritual that you like. Like maybe you have um, a heat pack that you put on your back or maybe you have one of those little like neck massage devices. You could uh, enjoy that while you create your 10 ideas. I love it. You get to eat chips. Yum. Salt and vinegar. That's my favorite. Have another bourbon. <laughs> there are actually many things about alcohol that sometimes make associative thinking uh, work. So you can definitely try that out, I would say. Yeah, in line at Starbucks. That's great. Awesome. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is go ahead and look through um, these ideas for craving and pick one. Oh, that's cool, Kunal, I, or Chris V. 
you put your roller, it looks like your foam roller for exercise, I'm assuming, and you put your idea notebook inside of it. So while you're doing your foam roller exercise and stretching, you could be generating your ideas. Awesome. Okay, fabulous. So pick either yours or someone else's that you like and happily steal that as your craving in that quadrant. And you can put after or during or while I blank, generate 10 ideas, I get to blank. Okay, awesome. I think what we have time to do is maybe just, um, Jeremy, maybe we'll, we'll call pause on these. I think these are the two definitely. most powerful to design yeah. around. Yeah. And then um, maybe we could do a follow-up or you can definitely read it in the book, um, tips around designing response yeah. and reward. And do we wanna do a little bit of brains? Do we wanna have some practice right now, Jeremy? Or what are you sensing? I, I would love to have a moment to wrap just because there's a couple things I wanna remind folks of. Maybe one kind of... Uh, buyer beware situation here i don't know for lack of a better word i don't know is that is that too is that too ominous of a uh, of an introduction to what let's I'm about see to what say. are you going to share so it's a little bit of an <laughs> ominous introduction but the idea is um okay so we've been talking about how master of creativity practice these things specifically as it regards to updating the creative operating system what do we mean we mean you're mindfully engaging practice on a daily basis, remembering that your creativity is a, is a craft which is honed through conscious practice and a critical flip that needs to be made regularly to develop that muscle is this flip from a quantity orientation, sorry, a quality orientation to a quantity orientation. But I want to say one thing about volume as we as we wrap here, because there's one surprisingly, I mean, obvious thing about volume, but it's worth mentioning here. And it is the following. Ideas fall against some kind of normal distribution. You can picture it like this. This is just my crappy clip art version of it. But ideas fall across a distribution, right? And in the middle of that distribution, you have what? you have ordinary ideas, okay? The majority of your ideas are gonna be ordinary. On one end of the distribution, you have what you might call genius ideas, okay? And then on the other end of the distribution, what's the opposite? I would say goofy is, is you know, uh, one way to think about it. Most people don't want the left outcome. And so you know what they do? They eliminate variability. But when you eliminate variability, you know what you're left with? mathematicians out there, this is what you're left with. A bunch of ordinary stuff. It's impossible to only to cut off only one side of the distribution. So when you eliminate your variability, what you're eliminating is not only the goofy ideas, but you're also eliminating the genius ones. And so if you think about it, if you want, if, if, if you really do want to get to genius, you've got to put up with a lot of goofy too. And it's really useful, I find, just to remember this distribution because ultimately we all get to choose which distribution, what, what we want our idea distribution to look like. And if we're not willing to put up with Goofy, we're also not going to get the breakthrough stuff either. And it's just good to be aware of. But if we, if we say we really want the breakthrough outcomes, then what we know is and what we can feel comforted by is there's going to be a lot of, a lot of you know, as, as Kevin Kelly said, a multitude of bad ideas that I'm never going to want to share. It's fine. You know why? Because I know that's the that's the the input, the requisite input required to get to the kind of output I'm looking for. So I just wanted to end on that note because it's very important to remember. 